Okay, so uh, uh, hi and welcome to this presentation. Uh, my name is Alvin Lorenzon and this is Timmy Forsberg. And we have chosen to the topic chaos theory and uh, some of its applications. So here is the outline of the presentation. Uh, we will start with a brief introduction to the field of chaos theory, uh, similar to the one that uh, Klaus had this in one of his first lectures. Uh, then we will continue on with the history of the field. And uh, we, got, we couldn't predict that Stellan had read some of our material, because he stole most of our history part. Uh, but I think uh, repetition is good, so uh, enjoy it. Uh, after that, we will talk some about uh, examples of chaotic systems to show you some different cases, both uh, the discrete case and the continuous case. And then we will continue on with the main part of this presentation, which is uh, applications with the chaos theory. And the first thing we will talk about is uh, cryptography. And then uh, Timo will talk some about uh, hyperchaos and uh, neural networks. Uh, lastly, we will conclude this uh, presentation uh, with some uh, bullet points, and uh, then hand over to the review group to present the discussion questions. So, uh, let's start. Uh, the first thing we can ask us is, what is chaos? Uh, and as much uh, we have learned about complex systems and so, it's hard to define, so we won't do that. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's easy to recognize uh, a chaotic system when you see it, because it has some uh, key characteristics that I will list now. So, the first thing is that, uh, we only have non-linear chaotic systems. Uh, and the second thing is what you have heard many times now, that chaotic systems are sensitive to initial conditions. And also, lastly, we have uh, that chaos theory in theory is deterministic. Uh, and that may sound a bit, bit weird, uh, because chaos sound does not sound deterministic. But the thing is that with the models we use and so on, if you use um, uh, uh, the correct uh, initial conditions, you actually can say something about the future. The problem is, in physics and nature in general, it's very hard to, to determine these initial conditions to uh, infinite decimal, decimal precision. But uh, Lawrence put uh, this in a good... Uh, he said something uh, that uh, concludes this. Uh, when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximate, approximately determine the future. So we can't determine the future with uh, our uh, approximate models. We have to have the correct model if we want to predict the future. So one question you can ask yourself is, is it really worth studying these chaotic systems, even though we can't determine, I uh, often can't determine these initial conditions to infinite decimal position. And now Timmy will talk some about the history of the uh, it all begins at a birthday party. And it isn't, it isn't so that this party is so... Sorry? <laughs> what happened? It isn't so that this party is so no. big that it spawns the, the birth of chaos. It's so that this is the king, he has his 66th birthday, and to celebrate this, he announces a competition. The competition to solve the three-body problem. Why? Because it would be good to know if the solar system is stable, and also, it would have implication at navigation at sea. Said and done. Eight months later, a competition, a, a winner is selected, Henry Poincaré, for uh, proving that there is no periodic orbit to this system. So he's the, one of the first person to glimpse his sensitivity towards the initial conditions. But he isn't considered the father of chaos because that would be Lawrence, uh, this guy in the lower right. You have uh, Poker in the middle, and this is the Swedish and um, Norwegian king. Anyway, so Lawrence is working on an order 12 differential equation. He's trying to simplify it, but he cannot do it. Uh, so he's, he's growing desperate. He needs a system that is simpler. Along comes Dr. Barry Saltzman, uh, top right. Uh, and he has just found a, a system of order 7. And so, so Lawrence gets very excited and starts working on this, and very soon, also Lawrence feels this sensitivity towards the initial conditions. 
and he carries out a, a thorough analysis of this, and the paper that resulted from that, that is the birth of KFC. Um, now onto some examples. I'll be Oops. Uh, okay, so uh, we have come to this part where we will show you some examples to show you some chaotic, chaotic systems. And uh, I will start off with uh, the classic example. Uh, Stella mentioned it yesterday at uh, the dynamic systems course too. Uh, but he didn't write a mathematical equation for it. But here it is. So it's called the logistic map. And the equation looks like this. Uh, and this is a discrete case uh, of a chaotic system. So we have uh, these, uh, th this equation dependent on two variables, which are r, that's a number larger than 0, and we have x, that is uh, a number between 0 and uh, 1. And uh, we want to see if this uh, function is chaotic or this system is chaotic. Uh, so we can test it for different values of r. Uh, so in the first case, we can try with r equals to 2, and we get uh, this uh, these results for a number of iterations. So as you can see, it converges against 0 0.5. Uh, and uh, so this, this is not chaotic at all. We can predict what happens in the future. The same thing happens when we use r equals to 3.2. Uh, but instead, we converge against two different numbers, which are 0 0.5130 and 0 0.7995. So we can still predict what happens. So not a chaotic uh, system. And in the last case, we have r equals to 3.6. And then we get all these uh, random numbers, it looks like. Uh, so here we have a chaotic system. And in a plot, I think Klaus showed this past in his uh, lecture too. So this is the plot where you can see uh, we have r on the x-axis. And we can see that for small values, it always converges uh, against one value. But for larger, we have this, this chaotic part. So uh, now Tim will talk some about the continuous case of the system. All right. So going to the continuous, I will just borrow the logistic equation that Alvin just used, and instead of incrementing by one, we just increment by a little. And when this little uh, is taken from a limit two to zero, we have a, a differential, differential equation, and we can solve it. And I did. This is the curve for it, and we see. No longer is this chaotic, and why not? And it has to do with the degrees of freedom that the degrees of freedom are, are somehow less. Now I want to show you this by one of the most important theorems in, in chaos, chaos theory, and it's called the poincare benedictine theorem. And it says that chaos cannot arise in a continuous system in, in dimensions two or, or lower. So, um, Explaining this further, the, the theorem says something like this, and we're going to do it in a game type of structure. Say we have a region R, and we're in it, and there are three rules. We have to move, we, we can't stop, and we can't cross our own path. And doing this, uh, there are only two possible scenarios. Either we end up in a orbit, coming back to the point where we started, or we end up in a, a limit cycle cycling towards either a point or some type of orbit. And, and when you have this cycling towards a point, it's called an attractor. Because points looks as it's attracting, so it's the, a basin of attraction. Uh, well, and as I said, you can have other types of attractors besides a port attractor. You can have an orbit attractor as well. Um, but these are basically all attractors. There is for two dimensions. so. Expanding to three dimensions, a new type of attractor is uh, introduced. It's called a strange attractor. And it's different from these previous attractors in that there is no longer a base of attraction where we can point and say, this thing attracts. The, it's somehow like the attractor itself is attracting. And well, a strange attractor also has to have a fractal structure. And I agree, one cannot really see it, but in order to see it, one has to make some type of transformation. But uh, it's not really visible. Right. 
And the first strange attractor that was found was the Lawrence attractor. This is why he's so famous now. And you can see the chaotic, his chaotic map on the right and the attractor on the left. I mean right, for you. Um, well, looking at that, we see, well, why is that chaotic? It looks very regular. And it's chaotic from the, from the definition or the traits of chaos. One, that it's a priori. The trajectories does not settle down into stable orbits. There are some orbits within the attractor, but they are not stable. Uh, secondly, we don't put in any randomness. This arises, arises straight from the normal linearity. And uh, the third one is that it's... Uh, uh, well, there's the third trick, too. I've forgotten it. Uh, and there are many more attractors. Uh, I just want to show you them so that you have seen them. Some of them look like their own Lawrence attractor and some of them don't. Right. Expanding to one more dimension, we, we enable more freedom and so we enable more chaos. It's, why do I show you this? Because sometimes in applications, the more chaos you have, the better. So having a way of improving the chaos could be good. Right. So hyper chaos. Um, so we have expanded to four dimensions. And um, sorry. It, it's just well, if you just have chaos in four dimensions, that doesn't mean we have hyper chaos. In order to have hyper chaos you need to have more chaos than chaos. So, so here example you can see a two-dimensional projection of a nine-dimensional attractor. And why it into self by, by looking at something that it's really hard to imagine while we can listen to it. Sound will always be sound. So I want to show you a video of how chaos sounds like. Mostly for fun. <laughs> The Rossler attractor. And when it does that, it's, it's called a bifurcation, but it goes down into the stable orbit. This is the Rabinovich uh, Fabricant attractor, also called Spiral Chaos. Imperial doubling, a bifurcation between the Rossler attractor and the Rabino which from your county right there. Loris attractor. They all sound very similar in these ones. <laughs> and we, we plot it. There's two plots because you can do this thing with your eyes so it becomes three-dimensional. I can do it. And the last example is of hyper chaos. A hyper chaotic attractor. We plot it. It's three different uh, plates, so you can see from different angles. <laughs> it sounds very different, it's like raindrops on a car roof or something. Yeah. Systems and uh, how it sounds, uh, and I will uh, continue on now with uh, the first application, which is cryptography. And the word cryptography comes from the Greek word words. Cryptos, I don't know Greek, so sorry for my pronunciation. It means secret or hidden, and graphene maybe, uh, which means uh, writing. So essentially, we have uh, secret writing, uh, and as many of you know, cryptography is about delivering one message. Uh, secretly, uh, so that only the uh, recipient can read, can read it. And we have some examples of uh, simple ciphers or uh, uh, that are uh, uh, well, well known in history. The first one is the Caesar cipher, which uh, uses uh, the alphabet and just moves the letters in the alphabet a couple of steps. 
So in this case, we have moved the alphabet three steps um, so that E becomes B and F becomes C. And as you can see, this, is, uh, this isn't a good uh, way of uh, encrypting messages because we have only 25 different combinations. But maybe it worked during uh, Caesar's time. Then we also have uh, the Enigma, which is uh, a new machine used by the Germans during World War II to encrypt messages from the Allied countries. Uh, so, and these two examples are both examples of uh, symmetric key encryption, where both the, the sender and the receiver shares the same key, both to encrypt and decrypt. So for this, in, in, uh, in the Caesar example, the key would be how many steps to move the letters in the alphabet. So, but there are some uh, downsides with this symmetric key. Uh, we are, uh, uh, when we want to mes send messages to a lot of people, we have to have shared a lot of keys. And that is a problem uh, if you want to have to distribute new keys and stuff, so on. So in the late uh, 20th century, uh, some scientists found out a new way, which is called the public key encryption. And instead of sharing one key, uh, one, uh, the receiver has, uh, two keys instead, one private key and one public key. So if I want, for example, to send a message to Timmy, I use his uh, private key to encrypt the message, and then uh, uh, his, public, his public key I use to encrypt the message, and then uh, Timmy uses his private key to decrypt it. But in the case of cryptography with chaos, uh, we are mostly using symmetric key uh, today, because that's how far the field has come. Uh, so now we can ask ourselves, uh, how can uh, chaos be uh, applied in the field of cryptography? Uh, cryptography is in need of uh, symmetric outputs. So if we put something in, uh, we want the same thing out. Uh, or not the same thing out, we want... Uh, if we stop, put something in, we want one thing out. And if we put the same thing in again, we want the same thing out again. So no randomness. We have to have the same uh, output every time. And also, we need that keys similar to the correct key should, uh, should not generate uh, results close to the, to the real encrypted message. Uh, uh, this is called, uh, also called diffusion. And this is, if someone wants to crack your cipher, you don't want them to be able to guess uh, keys, keys and then maybe find something that gives them a hint what the real key is. So what does chaos theory have that, uh, that can uh, that match these uh, components of cryptography. So the first thing is that we have this, what I talked about in the beginning, deterministic thing, that if we input the same initial conditions, the start values, into a uh, system, we get the same thing out. We have no randomness. And also we have this sensitivity to initial conditions, which can be similar to this diffusion or uh, key thing. So in theory, this seems pretty good. And I will now, now show you an example made by two scientists at an Indian university uh, using the logistic map I explained before. Uh, so here is uh, the example. Let's say I want to send this very secret message, hello to Timmy, uh, and I have uh, this key, uh, which is, uh, you know, these parameters in, in the logistic map. Uh, but remember that R has to be in the interval of the chaotic part, uh, whereas it would be it would, we would have convergence. And the n is the number of iterations we want to do our uh, mm -hmm. logistic uh, iterations for. So uh, here's the algorithm. It's uh, pretty simple. We first convert our letters in the, in the message to ASCII numbers. So H becomes 72 and E becomes 45 and so on. And then we create, also create even spaced intervals on the table, on the ASCII table. Uh, so, uh, so, so all the uh, all the characters uh, appear in the interval zero to one. So, for example, blank spaces in the interval zero to zero point zero one, and so on for each side. And then we run uh, this encryption algorithm. Uh, we use the logistic map, uh, as I said before, and we uh, calculate these y's by by inputting our x zero that we showed in the beginning and add 0 0.81, which was our uh, H, and that was uh, 72 in this case. And then we do it for uh, uh, every letter, uh, and 
instead of uh, inserting x0 every time, we use the, the y we calculated before. So now uh, we have a lot of y's, uh, and we can check where these y's, uh, in what interval in this uh, ASCII table we created, and, and match these with the characters. So we can see that y1 uh, becomes uh, a slash, and we can do this for every letter. So we get an, encrypt an encrypted text. Uh, now let's say we have an opponent, that is someone who wants to crack our cipher. And we, let's say that this opponent is really, really good at guessing keys. So he guesses uh, uh, that the x naught should be 0 0.56781, the same. And also he guesses that the n must be the same too. But instead of our r, he, uh, he guesses that it should be the same thing, but 10, uh, added 10 to the minus 16. So it's pretty close to our initial, uh, I don't know what, what the key is. Uh, then he runs a simple uh, the decryption algorithm, which is essentially the algorithm backwards, and he gets a completely gibberish uh, output message. So we can see that uh, it's a pretty powerful uh, method. Uh, but there are some plots with cryptography and chaos. Uh, the thing is that it's not used in commercial or in general at all. Uh, we have these, uh, these uh, probes with it. As I said, we have um, we had attributes needed in cryptography. And also we have uh, the, uh, like the good diffusion. But there are also some cons. Uh, first thing is mostly in the papers I read is about symmetric keys. And we, won't, we don't want that because it's hard to handle. And also it's hard to prove the security of, uh, of encryption with uh, keys. Because standard methods uh, of uh, doing this doesn't work. And also, we are using real numbers, which are which is used. They are hard to use in practice. Uh, it, we have circuits and stuff, so it, it's uh, we want binary. And also, these uh, algorithms are really really slow. Uh, as we can, uh, we iterate each letter for fifty three thousand times in the example, and that is common for for most of these kinds of algorithms. But the general use of cryptography, we only have like 20 iterations for each, each letter. So we can see that this, uh, this is really, really strong. Uh, so this is, was uh, cryptography with chaos. Uh, it's a pretty new field, so maybe they will come up with something better sooner. Uh, but right now, it's, it's how far it has come. So now Tim will talk about the second application. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, give me a concrete example. You say, show me something that relates to my program. Program, and so I will give you that with the help of Bernard here. Uh, okay. So here, here's the concept. There exists substantial evidence that natural neural networks, aka okay, brains, exhibits uh, chaos and, and rich dynamics. Which makes us curious how the four neural networks work like that. What, what, what dynamics do they show? So, so that, was, that was what I was looking at. And here's a team that looked at this simple neural network. So, of network. Um, and they get these attractors, that they, they get lots of different uh, lots of stuff out, but these are the attractors, and they are. Um, it's hyper chaos. So very rich dynamics from something very simple. And this other paper, a team that looked at a slightly different network. Uh, the special thing is that for, for one of the weights, they, they replaced it by a memristor. And a memristor is what a weight would be in reality. So if you wanted to build an actual neural network, so in real life you would use memristors. And a memristor is it's a, a, a resistor with memory, and so it works very much like a wait, but it, it, it exhibits other types of dynamics, so, so the dynamics would be different. Um, yes, and they did this hyper chaos out effectors. And what's, yeah, uh, and how do they really do it? They, well, they, they model the system with differential equation and they solved. Try to solve them directly. 
That's how they got these graphs. And that uh, concludes our talk here. Uh, we have talked about the definition of chaos or what, what could be regarded as a definition. No actual definition exists. <laughs> there are determinism, no randomness is put it in. Uh, sensitivity towards initial conditions, the point that I forgot during my uh, Lawrence attractor slide, and the long term a priori behavior. We also talked about discrete and continuous chaos um, and or applications. Uh, through our research of this uh, subject, we have, uh, we have been forced to leave stuff out. It will come again in the dynamical course, but some of the, here they are some of them, Poincaré map, Hemel map, the opponent's bone, and so on and so forth. There are also some uh, subjects that are very close to ORS, and also complex systems, so if you haven't found a topic yet, here's, here's a list of uh, recommendations not theory, fractals, and system dynamics. All right. So, what does chaos theory have in common with uh, complex systems? Well, for one, they're very hard to predict, and there is also this emergent uh, property that comes out. And uh, with that, I thank you for listening. <laughs>
Uh, so if your weight is here and the other player knows that, then they can put the ball over there and then it takes a while to get there. Uh, so, so that's maybe one reason. Um, so, but I think, I think the most important and I, for me the most interesting reason is that uh, the fractals are ubiquitous in nature for the same reasons that we can find spheres in nature, like perfectly round spheres. Uh, and that is that they're really the optimal solution, it's, it's the optimal solution to an optimization problem. So uh, spheres are optimal in the sense that they minimize their surface uh, to the volume. So you have maximum volume and very small surface. And in the same way, what problem is our lungs trying to solve? Well, in lungs, the oxygen is stored on the inner surface of the lungs. So you want to optimize the amount of surface you have, uh, but minimize the volume because you don't want to take up, you know, you don't want to have like this big lungs because it's just impractical to move around with them. So you want to have really small lungs, but a lot of surface volume. And the optimal solution to that is fractal. So, so that's sort of the reason that we see fractals evolving everywhere in nature. So it's, it's very much, I, I think it's interesting in this way, because in, in nature, uh, fractals are a very common optimal solution to a broad range of problems. And, and I think this is, you brought up one link to complexity theory, and I think this is another link to complexity theory, because complexity theory focuses on these kind of systemic effects that we can find throughout nature. And evolution plus this being an optimal solution to a problem, uh, that is sort of a, a universal phenomenon. So, so I think that's another interesting thing. Um, do you have, Klaus, do you have any more comments? No, uh, it, it's, um, I just... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so, but, uh, All right. so review group? Yes. Review group, can come to the station, bring your questions. for that interesting presentation. Uh, we have a couple of discussion questions that you guys and I don't know, us also maybe to discuss. Uh, I think uh, Alvin almost uh, slipped the word there and used uh, randomness when he described uh, the last things. And uh, many people use uh, randomness and chaos interchangeably, so therefore we want you to discuss the difference between uh, chaos and randomness. Uh, and I can also get uh, uh, an application where uh, the chaos attributes like sensitivity to initial conditions can be useful and you also need that with the dishwasher. And we want you guys to also you know, think of uh, other things where it might be possible to use this as an advantage. Uh, yes, our third discussion topic is regarding chaos in neural networks that we talked about. And, um, was the, was the gain of studying this chaos in the other network, was the benefit of it, and also why do you want to create a physical model of a neural network of a brain. Yes, and finally uh, we would like you to discuss the uh, pros, pros and cons of uh, cryptography using chaos. Uh, for example, maybe you can come, come up with an uh, application where this concept is useful, even though it mainly uses symmetric keys and uh, also discuss its uh, robustness, for example, since it's a crucial property. Uh, 